All right, so I've been reposting all of my old lectures that include you know, the original version of my natural language processing class in mostly Jupyter, using Jupyter and Python. However, there is a day missing, so I'm going back and re-recording this lecture on part of speech tagging, the first half. And so be kind, because it's been a while since I've opened Jupyter Notebook. <laughs> but this section is going to cover categorizing and tagging words, which is mostly talking about parts of speech and how we can build a part of speech tagger. So this is part one of that section. So in general, what are the types of speech? So if we're going to tag these parts of speech, what does that include? Well, the big four would be nouns, adjectives, adverbs, and verbs, not in that order. Right? And so anytime you hear me say the big four, I'm always talking about mostly um, the semantic, the meaning-making verbs, the content words in a sentence. And so nouns and verbs do most of the driving of the sentences, as you'll see later in the semester, that have, you know, they're part of the um, parsing section. Adjectives and adverbs are modifiers on nouns and verbs. But there are a bunch of other types of speech that we also might be interested in tagging, like pronouns, determinants, and then there's a whole lot more. And so part of speech tagging includes classifying words into that part of speech, and sometimes this is just called tagging. An important component of tagging is the tag set. A tag set determines how many types of tags there are going to be. So the universal tag set, for example, has 10 tags in it. Mostly noun, adjective, adverb, uh, determinant, pronoun, I'm trying to remember them all. Uh, I've lost it. They have an X, one for numbers, I think. So there's only 10. But then something like the pen tree bank tag set has 50 some odd because it classifies things as like nouns plural nouns, proper nouns. And so you can get more or less specific based on which tag set you pick. However, if you're going to train your own tagger, you have to know what tag set is in that training data because then, you know, if it's only the universal set, you're kind of stuck with that. But if it's a more complex set, you could then reduce it. So in general, I try to go as, uh, as many tags as possible when training because you can always go smaller, but you can't go larger. And so in this section, we'll learn how to tag text automatically. And one of the key issues that just permeates all of natural language processing is um, poly polysemes or polysemy or polysemy, however you want to say it, um, where words are not just one part of speech or one part of meaning. Because, um, you know, some words can be multiple parts of speech, like the word that. I think in one of these examples is nine different parts of speech. And understanding grammar helps us know what part of speech it should be because some words only appear in certain places, but also understanding meaning will help us translate which part of speech it is. And so focusing here on NLTK, the POS underscore tag or part of speech tag function will automatically tag words using a pre-built token uh, tagger. It does have to tag something that's tokenized already. So the function for that is part of speech tag. And then in the parentheses, the text variable, usually a list that's been tokenized. I remember we also have the word tokenized function to help us do that component. So, so here are some of the basic tags. DT for determinant. Remember that a determinant is things like V, and A. NN for noun. VB and lots of different forms for verbs. So VBZ, VB, there's VBP, maybe past tense, um, and JJ for adjective. Adverbs are often listed as RB. So let's just do a basic example here. I've imported NLTK, and then from NLTK, I've imported word tokenized so that I can create my tokenized list. And I've just saved here that tokenized list as text. And so I do NLTK dot part of speech tag for on my text. And you'll see what it returns is a list, square brackets, of tuples, in little parentheses, that are pairs. 
And so this list of tuples is the original word that it saw and then the part of speech tag. So we got the dog is sleepy because I can hear her snoring behind me. Um, the determinant dog is a noun, is, is a verb, and sleepy is an adjective. Now, if I use a more complex sentence here that has some of this issue of different parts of speech, right? they refuse, that's, an, that's a verb, to permit right, us to obtain the refuse, that's a noun, permit, also a noun. And so we've got two words here, re refuse, given its pronunciation, and permit, where in the first case they're both verbs, and in the second case they're both nouns. And it actually captures that pretty well. So they, pronoun, refuse. Uh, this is a present tense verb, VBP. Um, two, and two is listed as a two. It's kind of this infinitive case. Verb, permit, us, proper noun, or sorry, pronoun. <laughs> to obtain is another verb. So we've got three verbs in this sentence. <laughs> uh, the re refuse permit. And these are both nouns. So we capture that distinction pretty well. Right? Because you really wouldn't have two verbs at the end of a sentence. Now, if you're wanting to learn more about how this function works, remember you can use the help function on, and you got to do the whole thing, NLTK.POS tag, because we haven't really imported the POS tag function, and it tells you a little bit more. So it actually does have the option here. This is the part I wanted to talk about. Where you can change the tag set. Um, by setting it to none, it picks, um, I think, pen tree bank. Lang equals English, but you could set this to universal. And then our English language. It gives you an example. And so now you can see more of them with this possessive tag. You can also see how you, you'd use a universal tag set. And then what it's returning, a tagged tokens, as a list of tuples. And it kind of shows you that there are going to be lots of options for tagging. So um, specifically this English and Rus Russian, but as long as you know the uh, ISO 639 code, you can pick different ones. All right. So why is that useful? Um, why would we use part of speech tagging other than it can lead to some really, really interesting research questions, but similarity is, is an important thing. So it can be defined by focusing on the same part of speech category. So I want to know how similar two nouns are, for example. It also allows us to understand predictive grammar if we're trying to come up with, you know, the next word to type in the search bar or um, for example trying to create a chat bot and so let's see here uh let's look at so we've got notk.txt right so we're converting this to a uh, specific type of text object it's a lowercase each word in the brown corpus words okay so for each one lowercase them and save it and I want to know what is similar to woman. So remember, we did this a while back, this text.similar. And then here's the first one. I think it goes to here. Now, I don't know why it prints a none between each one of these, but that's not a response. It's just like the next line down. So what are the most similar words to woman? Well, if you look, they're mostly other nouns. Man, okay, makes sense. Time, day, year, car world, house, family, country, boy. So these are all nouns. Okay, some of them could also be verbs. Similar to the word bot, which is mostly only a verb. Made, said, done, put, had, seen, both. So these are mostly verbs. Words that are similar to the, this is where it gets a little messy. Um, but what we see is other determinants, an and a, and then pronouns, okay, and then a couple of other uh, similar words that are function words rather than content words. So back to this point, understanding that part of speech allows me to understand what words might be similar and what words to predict next. Now to build our own tagger or, you know, to think about how they built this tagger is that you have to have a tagged corpus. 
And so some of the limitations on what we can do just naturally fall under the fact that there are only so many resources that have the right type of data for us to do training with. And that's gotten way better over the years. So a tagged corpus is one that has usually a list of tuples. Okay. And so I, I don't remember if this is a reminder for this course since it's been a while since I've taught this version of the course, uh, but just a reminder overall. A tuple is a set of um, immutable or not changeable objects. And so once something goes into a tuple, you can't rewrite like the first half of the tuple, the second half, you just have to erase it and rewrite the whole thing. And tuples are really handy because they provide some like sort of internal structure. And so one thing that I have learned since I've taught this course is that you can have a list of tuples and that makes it easier to convert into a data frame using pandas, for example, because tuples kind of help provide a structure to that list. So you might say each tuple is a row or each tuple set is a column, right? a set of columns rather. Um, so they're a sequence of immutable objects. You can't change them. You will see them as parentheses okay, in the output. A list is a sequence of changeable objects, much like a list in R. They can be a list of a list. You can have a list of tuples. The tuples can be all different sizes. They can be different types. And so we can, we kind of talk about lists as if they're similar to vectors in R, but they actually are a bit more loose. You can do more with them than just a one column of data, for example. And when you see lists in Python, they're structured with the square brackets. So you'll see the representation of tagged tokens a couple of different ways, depending on which tagged corpus you're looking at. And they're often in this weird word slash part of speech format, which, you know, if I'm doing word tokenize from NLTK, it's not going to like that very much. So there is a function in NLTK that deals with the fact that they know that these are in a strange format and it's string to tuple. And so it creates the tuple when you have that slash. So if you have a data set that has this, kind of slash format, you can convert it into a list of tuples. So you can say tag nltk.tag.string to tuples where that bad boy is hidden and convert these um, special formats into tuples. Now, when I start to look at corpora, one of the most famous ones is the brown corpus. We joke that this is the most overused corpus, but it's really handy for teaching people how to do this kind of stuff because it is a uh, gold standard corpus. Okay, it's really old, but it does have the um, tagged data set, so you can use it to check uh, what you're doing. Right? Now, I would say that the, if you train something on Brown, it may not generalize to data now because we use words in different ways. And obviously over the last, oh gosh, oh my God, is it almost, it's 60 some odd years old almost. Um, we've clearly changed the word meaning, but a determinant is pretty much always a determinant. And so this could be combined with other data to help um, give your tagger a robust generalization. But if I look at what the Brown Corpus looks like, we have the Fulton County Grand Jury said Friday, an investigation of Atlanta's recent primary election produced no evidence that any irregularities took place. And this is sort of a funny sentence given when I'm recording this at the end of 2020. <laughs> but um, basically the, the sentence here is so it's a single, the first sentence in the Brown Corpus has this uh, word part of speech format. Okay, so AT for determinant, NPATL. I don't even know if I know what that means, but NNTL, I know is a noun. Right, grand jury here, so grand got the adjective tag for jury, okay, and so on. Okay. VBD is past tense. But in general, we're not going to have to, to deal with that too much. So NLTK offers a bunch of different form, ways of dealing with these formats. And so it's sort of a pity that this package doesn't uh, kind of keep up to date because it 
does have a lot of cool stuff still in it. And so we can look at uh, and use this tagged words function. And that just takes those tagged sentences and converts them nicely into tuples. So we don't have to mess with string to tuple. It's already got a, an internal function to deal with that on the brown corpus. So any of the corpora that are included in NLTK that have these tags, have this tagged words argument. And that outputs a giant list with all of the tuple pairs. Okay, I'm getting mad. There we go. So the universal part of speech tag set uh, allows us to kind of think about this in a global way as opposed to getting very specific. So uh, I can switch from my NPTL, which I don't really remember what that means, to universal to convert to a common tag set. And I can do that within the tagged words function. Excuse me. And now I've got this easier set to deal with, determinant and noun. So I know it starts with an N, it probably is a noun, but I think it's a proper noun, <laughs> or what the TL part stands for. And if you ever want to know, um, you can pull up the tag set from the brown, or it's just as easy to Google brown tag set. And there's a web page that I'm sure I have like bookmarked six times <laughs> that has the, the list in it. And this is the universal tag set. So what did I forget? Conjunctions. Uh, so we got nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, big four, pronouns, determinants, and articles are grouped together, ADP for prepositions and postpositions, mostly we think about these as prepositions, in, above, below, that kind of stuff, uh, numerals for numbers, conjunctions, and but, or, particles, and punctuation marks. The X here is sort of a catch-all for everything it doesn't know. And some other languages that have different cor corpora, so Chinese, Hindi, Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, and Catalan. And, but you would need to download the entirety of the NLTK resources, and not just the partial set that we did at the beginning of the class. All right, so in this example, we're just going to count up the most frequent types of words. And so I imported from uh, the brown corpus, so from NLTK corpus, import brown. We're going to pull out the news data set, okay, so brown.tagged words, grab just the news, um, but this list will actually hold true no matter which half of brown you pull out. I can use the universal tag set, excuse me. Now, here's our frequency distribution. Remember that frequency distribution gives you a table, it's just like the table function in R. But I do need to loop. Okay. So we've got our tagged tuple set, and we're just going to say, okay, I want to count the tag for each uh, of those tuples. Those tuples are structured as word, comma, tag. Okay. So just count the tags, ignore the words, in that tag data set. And there's two here because it if you tell it I want to count tags for tags, it's going to be like, uh, got uh, what the function, what does it say? Um, expected one got two or something. So it, it wants you have to tell it that this is coming as pairs and I only want the second one. And then it counts them up. Let's do most common. Remember, most common um, structures them from max to min. And what we see is that nouns and verbs are the most common parts of speech, types of parts of speech, followed by prepositions, punctuations, determinants, and then the other two adjectives and adverbs. Cool. Now, when I call them the big four, I don't mean that they're the most popular four, although nouns and verbs are pretty much the most popular all the time. Um, depends on determinants sometimes, what kind of speech it is but they're the big four when it comes to meaning. So a lot of these other types of parts of speech are function words that hold up the syntax of a sentence. All right. Come on, Jupiter, work with me today. So let's talk a little bit about these different types of words. And so nouns, most people know what a noun is, right? It's a, um, 
an object that stands for uh, an or a concept a word squiggle squibbles on the page <laughs> that stand for a concept right so but they have particular grammatical slots so nouns appear at the beginning of a sentence in a noun phrase and we usually have some sort of verb phrase we'll learn more about this in our phrase uh, parsing section and then that verb phrase is usually again followed by a noun phrase so there there's specific spots to expect a noun and they often appear after determinate before the verb or an after an adjective and the adjective placement depends on the language English is very loosey-goosey about where we put adjectives um, sometimes you can do before sometimes you can do after you can just kind of stick them in places but lots of languages have rules about where the adjective should go so almost anything that starts with an N or an MP is a noun tag or noun and noun proper and so let's see here what are we doing so let's create bigrams of all the brown words remember bigrams are pairs of words so we're basically doing every pair combination in that tagged news data set so the Fulton Fulton County County Jail it just creates all of the pairs I'm gonna loop over those pairs and look at a and B so word and tag Oh no, sorry, this is not tagged. This is every pair of words. So the Fulton, Fulton County, County Jail. Okay, and I want to grab that pair if B is a noun. Okay. Now what are we gonna do A1 here, B1? Okay. Because this is the tagged data set. So it's actually kind of a pair of a pair. So we've created a pair of words, the Fulton, Fulton County, but the is also still tagged as a determinant. Fulton is still tagged as a noun. And so what we're doing is we're grabbing the first word, um, part of speech, because remember, Python is a zero language, if the second word's part of speech is a noun. And so that's the why the little square brackets because A is a tuple and B is a tuple. So we've got tuples and tuples. <laughs> and uh, remember that A0 would be the word and A1 is the part of speech. So we're saying give us a part of speech if that second word is a noun. Well, what is it? What happens? Again, again, use uh, the frequency distribution, but we only have a, a whole list now, so we don't have to do any fancy looping. And one of the most common things that happen in uh, where noun like in front of a noun so nouns are often followed by nouns this is the universal tag set um, I'm sorry this is proceeding so nouns often have a noun in front of them or a determiner or an adjective okay, it's the most popular options sometimes a preposition sometimes punctuation because it starts the next sentence or a verb and so the other ones just kind of drop off but surprisingly uh, nouns are often preceded by other nouns and this has a lot to do with proper noun naming now verbs so we can look at the most common verb itself or we can look at words that are both verbs and nouns and we're just doing some exploring here of the different types of things that happen with parts of speech. So we're going to pull out the um, Wall Street Journal out of the tree bank corpus using the universal tag set. And I'm just going to create a, a frequency distribution of that tag set. And I'm going to grab here just to show you what it looks like. The most common words just are common. This one's going to be common parts of speech here, or the most common tuples, rather, uh, from that. And that's what this is doing. Okay. Is the um, most common five, right? So it's zero, one, two, three, up to, but not including five. So zero, one, two, three, four. And so the most common tuples here are punctuation a comma the word the the period right, the word of and then two and so it's a tuple a list of 
embedded tuples. <laughs> so this is the a tuple as slot one, and then this is the tuple of the um, of the count. Okay. Now this crazy loop here, what it does is it loops over those tuples, these tuples that we've got here, and grabs the first embedded tuple. So this is a kind of like double embedding I was talking about. So it loops over these. So tuple one, tuple two, tuple three. And so it's expecting that pair combination. In WT though, we have, which is um, the first slot here, or the zero slot, if you will, uh, we have a pair. So we tell it to grab the first one out of the pair. If do, 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 the second one out of the pair is a verb. And this just allows us to figure out what are the most common verbs. And it's not too surprising. Is said, was, are, be, has, have, will. Okay. And this kind of set is true almost no matter what English you look at. Now, what do I do about words that are multiple parts of speech? And so we created a conditional frequency distribution on the Wall Street Journal set. And let's just pull out some words that we know. So in that, I know the word yield is in there, and I also know the word yield is multiple parts of speech. It can be a verb or a noun. Okay, yield like stop, like you yield in a car, or yield like the yield of a crop. So it's more commonly a verb than a noun, but it's almost even split. And then we could loop through this whole thing, I have this kind of later, where we loop this whole thing and grab words that have the most parts of speech. But let's currently transition to adjectives and adverbs. Get some more coffee here. All right. <clears throat> so adjectives describe nouns, and they're often used directly in front of noun as a modifier, a large pizza, or in the predicate of the sentence or the, the secondary kind of adjective phrase where you might say the pizza is large. Adverbs modify verbs for time, place, manner, or direction. So it's something like, I made notes slowly. Okay, that tells um, the manner of my making of notes. Unfortunately, adverbs are a little <laughs> fun sometimes because they can also modify adjectives and really is a good example of a word that does goofy things in the English language. So, you know, English is three languages in a trench coat pretending to be one, and it does not always follow the rules. So adverbs generally modify verbs but not always. So let's do a couple things. Let's pick a lexeme. Remember lexeme here as concept, um, a head word. Find what words are around that lexeme. So what are the most common collocates or bigrams? And then figure out what the most common part of speech is for that lexeme, around that lexeme. And here uh, we're picking the word often. So I'm going to grab a different corpus here. So we're just going to grab Brown's words, um, not tagged words, just words here, uh, on the learned category. And we're going to create this um, sort of bigram list. All right, so let's start here. So grab B. Actually, I want to do this yeah so grab b for a bigram pair a comma b in nltk bigrams so we're creating a set of bigrams here of every word followed by every other word so the fulton fulton county county jail and grab b if a is the word often so we're saying often and then grab the second word remember that the set function is like the unique function in r and it grabs the unique set. Then the sorted function puts them in alphabetical order. Okay, so this is the alphabetical order list of the unique words that appear before the word often, which you know <laughs> looks crazy when you type it out. But if we scroll through this, it's quite long. Um, what you see contain, differ, difficult, encountered, equate, it keeps going. Um, so there are a lot of words that often uh, occur, they occur after often, often become, often call, often contain. And you could change that word up, but we'll leave it as often. 
Now let's see what parts of speech there are. So for that, I've got to grab the tagged words this time instead of just the words. And I'm going to use that universal tag set just to keep it easy to read. And we get the same list, right? So there's a pair of words in the bi bigram, okay? but now there are pairs of tuples. So it's two tuples together. And we want to grab when A is often, so the first word is often, we want to grab the tag for the second word. So I don't need to see that second word, I just want to see its tag. Then I ran a frequency distribution on those tags just to count them up in a table format. And I say, hey, print it out. So most often, uh, the word that follows often is a verb. And so we can see what kind of word often might be if it's followed by a verb. I might make it an adverb because it's modifying the verb. And it explains the sort of time, I guess, of that word. All right. Now, let's try this on the chat corpus. The chat corpus is just a list of chats from like an old message board. Definitely needs more coffee. Whew. All right, so let's put all those words together in pschat.words. It's just a huge list of words. And this is that exact same function, but now we're gonna see with, about the word you. And what we find is there are a lot of wild things. So what happens after you? You kidding, you know, you looked, you looked. Now some of these little you ones are like smiley faces, emojis, that kind of stuff. Dot, 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 you will, you are, you, you've, you have, okay. question marks. And we should probably do some text normalization here and make these all the same case, but you get the idea. So with that, the NPS chat also has tagged words. We're going to do that the exact same function that we just did. Um, grab B, if A is you, tell me what types of words Go back to you. You is a pronoun. And most common things, verbs. And that makes sense because pronouns often are the noun phrase at the beginning of a sentence. It's the follow of verbs. Nouns, adverbs, and then just a smattering of other little things like uh, prepositions, determinants, adjectives, pronouns. So it's kind of weird to have double pronoun. Um, but this is chat, so it's not necessarily the most grammatically structured piece, but generally verbs come next. Now, let's get even deeper here. What kinds of words might be confusing to non-native speakers? Okay. What words are confusing to native speakers? <laughs> I mean, um, English has lots of words that have multiple parts of speech and multiple meanings. And so that might be hard for children, for learners, you know, acquirers, if you will. So people learning or acquiring the language have to find these distinctions. Now this looks bonkers, but let's talk about what happens. So we're creating a conditional frequency distribution. We'll do a little bit of normalization here and make them all lowercase. So for each tuple, I want the whole tuple back. So the lowercase word, what, what was that? Lowercase word and tag for every word and tag combination in the NPS tagged data set. Okay, so we're gonna look at chat data because it's a little bit more naturalistic of people speaking. And then so for each of those data sets, we're going to uh, sort them on their condition. If the word length, the amount of tags in the data set is more than three. So the length here is not the length of the word, but it's the length of the number of times that that word occurs in the data set. So we essentially remember have this giant table that's got all of the words going down as rows, all of the types of parts of speech as columns, and then is a list of numbers in the middle. And so what we want to do is just say, okay, if that word has more than three possible um, tags, grab those tags and print them out. 
And so this is kind of like if you imagine a data frame of words by parts of speech where the number, the words are numbers in the middle. And, and the data is a bunch of numbers. How many times that happened? What we're grabbing here is, okay, if that row has more than three real numbers in it, print it out. And so these are things that have at least three parts of speech. Okay, or I'm sorry, at least four, because it's greater than three. And you can see that there are a lot of them and the page keeps, this keeps going, right? Um, but we've got one off on, damn, <laughs> back down. So there are a lot of words that are uh, multiple parts of speech. And that's what makes learning how to part of speech tag so difficult, because if it was one to one, then it would be really easy. So let's add a new, oops, zoom out a little bit here. Let's add a new wrinkle to our Python learning. Talk about dictionaries. So we're going to briefly pause and talk a little bit about Python and then go back to why we're, why we're talking about it here. And so we've mostly been working with lists and tuples and these embedded tuples and to, like lists of tuples and tuples. But another important data type is a dictionary. And the three, these are the three biggest types of objects that you might work with until you move into some, I know, a more structured package like pandas. And so dictionaries use these key value pairs, much like a phone book. The key has to be unique. And so you can think of each key as an entry in the dictionary where you cannot repeat words or entries. The pairs do not have to be unique, the value part. And keys and values can be complex combinations of things. <laughs> they just have to, the keys just have to be unique. So we often might use like word, word is the key, part of speech is the, the value because parts of speech can repeat, but key, words cannot. Or we might use word frequency, um, but lexical entries can get pretty complicated. Now the distinction when you see this stuff in the output is that you'll get these curly brackets for dictionaries as opposed to our lists and tuples that we've already seen. So why is that useful? Why would we add more complications to Python? But let's just make ourselves a little dictionary here. So I'm going to say, okay, parts of speech equals an empty dictionary here. I'm going to add some values. Parts of speech for Swiss, uh, it's an adjective. Part of speech for cheese, uh, it's a noun, and print that out. And so you can see the structure here. And so this looks a lot, if you're familiar with JSON, this looks a lot like JSON format. Okay. And so we've got our key, colon, value. Right. Now it does print a little differently than a list. So if I make the parts of speech here, this is our dictionary. Remember, it looks like this. If I say, you know what, make that a list and print it out, it prints out the first, the, the keys. If I tell it to print out the keys, okay, it prints out the keys again. But then the, I could say, okay, just kidding, make me a list of values. Or a list of items. And so this one to me is the most useful because we can convert these back to a list of tuples. So if I can go from a dictionary to a list of tuples, clearly I can also go the other way. And sometimes dictionaries are just easier to work with. Now each key can only have one entry. So I can't do part of speech well equals noun, part of speech well equals verb, part of speech well equals adjective, because it will just overwrite each time. But I could say, well, the parts of speech for well include nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. So you can make this side into a list or a tuple or another dictionary, but I don't recommend that. Uh, right now because <laughs> it gets really complicated really fast. Come on, click, click, click. So now we can start to use this to our advantage and this will become handy when we start to build part of speech taggers because we could make a lookup dictionary which essentially says, you know what, just best guess the part of speech for every word is its most common type of part of speech which is a good place to start. Maybe not the most um, best part of speech tagger, but a good place to start. All right. 
more coffee. So, <clears throat> a default dictionary is a very handy place to start because then when a, a user introduces a new value, it doesn't go, Bleh. I don't know what's happening. So from collections, we're gonna import default dictionary. I'm gonna say part of speech here is a um, dictionary, but specifically a dictionary, which is default value as a list. And I say, okay, print that out. And it says, hey, I'm a dictionary and I'm an empty dictionary, but part of speech here, so part of speech for well is a noun. Okay, print that out. I'm a dictionary that has uh, one entry, one key value pair. Now if I say, you know what, the part of speech here for cheese, I didn't actually tell it what it should be. I just said, hey, print it out. It doesn't actually print because I didn't tell it to. Um, but here I did tell it to and it said, well, you know, you called this, so assuming you want it, but I don't really know what to put here, so I'm going to put an empty list. And this just allows you to add and call for pairs that don't exist. So it doesn't give you an error message, but it will create a, a placeholder for those that you could fill them in later. And then even later, we can talk about how filling them in, you could fill them in with a, a specific guess. Because if you don't know, a noun is a good guess. So why use these? Well, we could use them to create a list of all our word part of speech tags. We could see, then use that list, given that they're now structured as these key value pairs, instead of looping through these complex lists of tuples, we could just say, give us all the values. Okay. Give us all the keys. So we could see all the, all the parts of, all of the possible words with a specific part of speech. Okay. All of the um, possible parts of speech for a specific, specific concept. And this is a little bit more efficient lookup wise than creating a loop and a loop and a loop. So uh, I kind of changed the parts around here. So if you're looking at this chapter, which is chapter five, I'm going to skip real quick to section seven and then go back a couple of sections. And, you know, how do we even know what these words should be anyway? Right? Like, who made up these rules? And there are sort of three main ways that we can determine what part of speech a word should be. So we can think about its morphological cues, its syntactic clues, or its semantic clues and not cues. So what is a morpheme? Like what is a morphological clue other than a strange phrase? So a morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning in a word. So you can kind of think this as the, the base word, the head part of the word, the lexeme, and its add-ons. So if I say cat, okay, it tells me that there is a singular cat. If I say cats with an S at the end, that now has multiple meanings, uh, a secondary meaning, two cats. Okay, so cat would be the main word, the main morpheme, because it carries the unit of meaning, it tells you what the object is, and then the S would be another morpheme, because it tells you how many. And sometimes morphemes are tied, the, the um, affixes are tied to specific parts of speech. Oh, I should have known better than to do this in the middle of the afternoon. Oh, it's like sleepy, mid-afternoon sleepies. All right, so specific parts of speech. I-N-G is often a good clue. It's a verb, except for words like morning, which, you know, is the, is a an ing word that is not a verb. Ly is a good clue that's an adverb. S is a tricky one because S could be the third person verb. I walk, you walk, they walk, he walks. Okay, it could be plurals like cats or it could just be the words like class. So it can't just say if it ends in an S, it's this, right? But it's often a clue that it might be something. A syntactic clue is context. In most languages, like 75% of languages are subject, verb, object, or subject, object, verb. Word order is one of the strongest clues of meaning and parts of speech. So we can have a good guess that we're gonna get 
noun phrase, verb phrase, noun phrase, meaning we should expect at least one noun, at least one verb. And that slot, that word that should come next is a good clue. And we've already kind of seen that by creating these frequency distributions, right? So what follows a noun, what follows a verb, that kind of thing. And then the trickiest one of all is semantic clues. And see that's tricky because often it's kind of a circular logic. Like if I know what part of speech it is, it tells me usually what the word means. But if I know what part of the word means, I might know what part of speech it is. And so it's kind of this loop here where you have to kind of figure out which end you want to work from. Um, but often the surrounding words can indicate the part of speech based on their meaning as well. Okay, so here's an example. No matter where you go, the internet is following you. Almost every portable device is made with an internet connection. Most new TVs and other appliances come with internet connections as well. This is so true right now. And then our made up word at the end here, the internet is truly rapturous. And so we gave people these sentences and asked them what the last word meant. And they mostly described this as like extraordinary, it was usually an adjective, right? And we asked them, well, how did you know what that was? And then they would pick words around it to say, this is the word that I use to help me understand. And so they often picked the internet because that is what it is modifying, right? And so if they pick a noun, what modifies a noun? An adjective. Now the fun part is we can combine these things together. So most tag sets have these basic categories, now verb, adjective. Some tag sets, oh wait, this skips, a, nope, okay. Some tag sets are more fine grained. So let's look at uh, specifically the word go here. Go is considered the base or lexeme, main lexeme, where it's a verb. Goes is the third person singular present, which we see as VBZ. Gone is the past participle, VBN. Going is the gerund form, VBG. Okay. Went, which is our simple past tense, is VBD. That's all one word. <laughs> this is six different forms. Right. And those are considered what are called morphosyntactic rules. So it involves the morpheme because it's changing from go to goes to going. And um, also involves the syntax because we have to have subject verb agreement here for goes, right? Or just tense agreement. And so that information is useful depending on what you're doing. And so you might just be interested in all of the uses of go. And so this extra verb distinction doesn't really matter to you but you might instead be interested in the number of times that the third person did something and now this vbz is a very important tag to you so it just kind of depends on your overall goals now let's just try some of this ourselves okay. and so we're getting to the the end of where this is going to break and so part two will be up online as well, but let's switch from using pre-tagged corpora to just tagging stuff ourselves. And that part of speech depends on the context of the sentence. So we're going to tag things at the sentence level because to use all of these cues, we need the whole sentence. And then we'll go back to that brown corpus. It has tagged information, so we can try to tag it and compare it to our results, our results to this sort of hand-tagged or predetermined set. Back to bigger. So from the corpus in Port Brown, we've already done this, but you know, I was just showing you the whole thing here. We're going to grab the brown, the news tagged sentences, and so we're going to grab the tagged version. It has that like slash now slash determinant, and then just the sentence itself, so that we can tag it without you know it doesn't have the extra piece there. And let's do quickly the default tagger. And then we'll break and the rest of the lecture will be up shortly. Okay. So we're going to start by assigning everything to the most common part of speech. Okay. And the default tagger is very handy because it's like a catch-all, it's like that default dictionary, right? Where if you don't know, a noun is a really good guess. But if you guess that everything is a noun, you won't do very well. 
you'll get more than chance because nouns occur more often than chance. But, you know, it's not going to really be great because you're going to tag everything as a noun. And generally, this is the backup option. So when I have a lot of text and I don't know, like I've, pa I've processed everything else and I just don't know, like this word, never seen it before, I don't know what it is, the best guess might be a noun. So this just becomes our like kind of catch for all the words that we don't know. And here's how you create a default tagger in an LTK. You call the default tagger in LTK dot default tagger and you tell it the rule. Okay, we're not quite into machine learning training just yet, but here we have the function and then the rule. And so this is ready to go now. It is going to tag everything as a noun. So I grabbed all of the news category words and I said, you know what? Tag those bad boys. And just so you can see that it's tagging everything as a noun. Not very effective, but can be useful for a cat for the last, you know, the last hurrah when you don't know what a word is. Now, is that any good? No, but sort of. And so all of these functions, the default tagger, the regular expression tagger, the unigram and bigram taggers that you'll see here in a, a little bit in the next section uh, have a couple of different base functions because they're set up this way. You, you teach them the rule and then they have a dot tag that applies that rule and a dot evaluate that will test if their rule is any good. Okay, now for evaluation you have to ta you have to show it the um, answers. So here in the tag option, we just showed it the, the individual words because we want to see what it comes up with as the answer. But here we have to, when we evaluate, we have to tell it, hey, what's the answer? And the number that you get back is the proportion of correct answers. So it, what it does is it creates a tag. Here are all of my answers that I think are what, what the parts of speech are. And then here are all of the right answers, and here's my proportion correct. And we got 13% or 0.13 proportion correct. I think we're currently using the universal tag set. I don't remember. Back up. Back up. Mm -hmm. No, we're using. Where's our tag sentences? Sorry. Uh, tag sentences. Oh no, we're using Brown's data set. Okay, well Brown's tag set I think has 53, somewhere in there, let's just say 50 different tags. And so chance would be one out of 50. So we're doing way better than chance, but it's still not very good. Most tags, um, part of speech taggers are in the 95% correct, if they're any good. And so this is where we'll stop for me talking right now to catch up, <laughs> re-record what we had originally recorded. And so the next like 20 or 30 minutes of this lecture, there's not a whole lot, is set to come out next week. So enjoy. And, and then I'll finish out the regular expression tagger and a couple of other taggers that you can use that are in NLTK, the lookup tagger, unigram tagging, right? Um, to build your own tagger, especially useful when you have a really unique data set that the pre-built pre taggers are not good.